Hello and welcome to a very special edition of Vital Signs. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta reporting to you from London with uh, two of the brightest minds in the field of longevity. Uh, we're going to find out what you can do right now at home to extend your life. If anyone has answers in this age-old search for immortality, it's the two guests we're about to introduce you to. Joining me today is one of the world's leading geneticists and chief science officer at SENS Foundation, Dr. Aubrey de Grey. He's also the author of Ending Aging, the rejuvenation breakthroughs that could reverse human aging in our lifetime. Also here is renowned explorer and founder of the Quest Network, Dan Butner. For Dan's best-selling book, The Blue Zones, his team discovered longevity hotspots around the world. Um, first of all, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. you both look healthy and well. Uh, and a cup of coffee. Trying to erase aging, yeah. <laughs> Dan, Dan uh, let, let's start with you. Uh, you and I have talked about this, this concept before, mm -hmm. but this idea that uh, there's lifestyle and then there's genes. Yes. Uh, that can dictate how long you're going to live your aging process overall. First of all, which is more important? And with regard to lifestyle, uh, things like diet, what can you do to try and reverse aging? Right. So for the average person, only about 10% of how long we live within certain biological limits is dictated by our genes. The other 90% is lifestyle. So the premise behind Blue Zones is if we can find the populations where people are living the longest and look for the common denominators, it gives us some clues to what we should be doing. What, so what are some examples? What, what, what are Blue Zones and, and what, what did you find there? Well, we, we found them in uh, Sardinia and Okinawa and Costa Rica, Icaria, and among the Seventh-day Adventists in America. They have nine common denominators and a few of them, uh, first of all, they almost all eat a plant-based diet. doesn't mean they don't eat any meat. Uh, secondly, they live in environments that nudge them into physical activity as opposed to mindful exercise, which for the most part people don't do their entire life. And then they think about who they hang out with. They're either born into uh, circles of friends that nudge them in the right behaviors or they proactively choose that because at the end of the day, who we hang out with has a long-lasting long impact in our health behaviors as opposed to diets or exercise programs which are, are invariably short-lasting. When you talk about diet though specifically, uh, what, is there a, a longevity diet to speak of? No, no. And I think diet's the wrong way to look at it. I actually think we should be looking at what to take out of our daily food regimen as opposed to what to put in our food regimen. But if you look at the longest lived people in the world, they tend to eat a lot of beans. Uh, we know from the Adventist Health Study that people who eat nuts four times a week, two ounces at a time, live two to three years longer than right. people who don't eat nuts. And we don't know if there's something magical in nuts or if just nut, eater, nut eaters have a better uh, diet. Uh, tofu seems to be a food that um, at least favors the Okinawans. And then among the Nicoyans in Costa Rica, an area that has the, lo the lowest rate of middle age mortality, in other words, these people have the best chance of reaching age 90 than any other population in the world, we see they eat a traditional Mesoamerican diet, a combination of beans, squash, and a type of corn that's been soaked in lye called niche tamal that has very high levels of niacin and very high levels of calcium, which might explain lower rates of heart disease and stronger bones in the older age. What did you have for breakfast? Um, I had a fruit bowl and a cup of coffee. Very high, very big source of antioxidants, both of them. Good, good, good for you. So, <laughs> so we're going we're to pay attention to that. First of all, uh, real quick, bouncing off what Dan said, 10% genes, 90% lifestyle. You buy that? Well, the proportions that come out of different studies vary a little bit, but certainly it's believed that only a minority of the of what goes into longevity is inherited, yes. At the other end of this idea of trying to prevent some of these age-related problems in the first place is this idea of rejuvenative medicine or, or something that you, were, that, you, that you work on quite a bit. Uh, first of all, is that, is that an accurate way of portraying it and, and what is it exactly? Yes, that is an accurate way of portraying it. Rejuvenation medicine is simply the application of regenerative medicine to the problem of aging. So regenerative medicine is something that people are becoming increasingly familiar with, things like stem cell therapy, tissue engineering. It's actually broader than that. There's aspects of medicine coming along that one might consider to be molecular regenerative medicine, the removal of molecular garbage from the inside of cells, for example, or from the spaces between our cells, the extracellular matrix. So there's lots of different aspects to it. But they're all moving forward quite rapidly. And really what my work focuses on, and my foundation's work, the Sense Foundation, is on looking at the possibility that within the foreseeable future, we may be good enough at all of these various aspects of regenerative medicine that we can put them together into a comprehensive panel of interventions that will be able to address the whole of aging. And the real advantage that we get from applying regenerative medicine to the problem of aging is that we can actually turn the biological clock backwards. We can take people who are already in middle age or perhaps older and 
turn them back to having a, a lower biological age than they had before. This is something that we can't do yet, of course, but it's something that is, it's, in my view anyway, foreseeable. And that's really why the work that Dan does and the work that other people are doing to explore how we can optimize our health today is so important, really. It, it amplifies the importance because it means it's not just a case of getting a few years extra before you have the downhill decline that we all still have anyway. It's a case of increasing your chances of making the cut, so to speak, of living long enough, healthy enough to be around when these future therapies come along that may be able to postpone the ill health of old age indefinitely. So, so lots of questions. I, I, I just find this really fascinating. First of all, you say moving very, very rapidly. Well, what are we talking about here? How fast is, is all this happening? Well, in terms of the actual outcome, in terms of longevity, we're not seeing very much yet because, as with any technology, you've got to develop the components and then put them all together before you get the end result. But if you look at the, actually what's going on, then uh, what's going on in the research fields that are involved, there's an enormous amount. So, for example, I wrote a book a couple of years ago, Ending Aging. Hardback edition came out in 07. Paperback edition came out one year later, 12 months later. In that time, so much had happened hmm. that we had to actually write an entire new chapter to add to the book in the paperback edition just to cover just 12 months of progress in the various regenerative medicine areas. And when you're talking about the, the potential here, uh, uh, reversing aging is something we're going to definitely talk about. But in terms of extending aging, uh, if, you, if you get to be about 65 in the United States, for example, you can bank on about another 19 to 20 years, uh, you know, on average. Uh, what are you talking about? How, how much could we be prolonging life? Well, we really don't know how long it's going to succeed in postponing aging. What we do know is that it's postponing the onset of age-related ill health that we're talking about. We're absolutely not talking about keeping people alive in a frail, unhealthy state uh, that characterizes the end of life today. Now, what I expect will happen within maybe the next 20 or 30 years, it could be longer if we get unlucky, is that we will reach a point where we are developing and improving and refining these regenerative technologies fast enough to keep staying one step ahead of the problem. And we're going to be at a point which I've called longevity escape velocity, where essentially we don't have... Longevity escape velocity. That's right. Okay, I like that. Where we have therapies that are not perfect, but are approaching perfection fast enough that people who are getting the state-of-the-art medicine every decade are going to carry on being as youthful as in early adulthood. You have said people could live hundreds of years. That's right. If we look at the statistics for what young people, young adults, die of in the industrialized world today, and we extrapolate out and we look at the possibilities that would happen if they just maintained that risk of death each year, however, old they, however long they lived, then that's exactly what you get, yes. Would you want, how long do you want to live, Dan? Oh, I wouldn't mind living to 150 or 200. And, and I, I think the things that Aubrey talks about um, give us the best chance of breaking through the ceiling right now. And the ceiling right now, I think, at the current level of science, is about 90. We, we should all hit 90. But in most of the industrialized world, uh, we're only living to 80 tops or 78 in America. Um, and somewhere along the line, we're leaving 10 good years on the table. And those, I think those 10 good years are the ones we can most easily get, and then thereby stacking the deck in our favor that some of the technologies that Aubrey's talking about will be in place for us to gain another 50 or 75 years. Or mm -hmm. The yeah, key thing really is not to focus on what one would do with those extra 10 or 50 or 500 years because, of course, nobody knows what they're going to do next week. But, really. but it does raise the question of retirement age, uh, how you pay for it, uh, uh, if you lose your loved ones, uh, what, what your life would be like. But sure. you're saying you're more focused on what are the causes of death and trying to... To target all sure. those I mean, nobody wants to get Alzheimer's disease. Nobody wants to get cancer or cardiovascular disease or type 2 diabetes or all the other things that go wrong with this in old age. Ultimately, if you don't want to get those things, then you want these therapies. And sure, there will be innumerable consequences in terms of society, in terms of the way that we restructure the economy and so on to, to handle the different demographics. But really, that's incidental. Well, that, there's a lot of questions about this. Uh, let, let's go to, uh, we got a lot of questions from our viewers, you might imagine. A question from our blog here. Uh, this, this question, how should one imagine a life of 100 years? Will you then be an aged man or woman for the last 200 years of your life living in a nursing home? You, you sort of talked about this, but, but you're saying you would stay in this youthful-like state potentially for hundreds of years. Absolutely, indefinitely. That's right. The only indefinitely. Reason, that's right. The only reason you would die would be from the same sorts of causes that young adults die of today. So, you know, being hit by a truck right. or whatever. 
Not, not, not everyone obviously embraces the idea of regenerative medicine, and, and people have, it, it's been controversial for lots of different reasons. Uh, we got another question here that somebody writes this, the quest for immortality is a dangerous endeavor with unprecedented catastrophic eff effects. Um, obviously that's a strong statement, Aubrey. I mean, how, how do you respond when, when yeah, people level think, these sorts of uh, things? You know, I'm, I'm fairly charitable about these questions, really, because I think it's per people are perfectly entitled to be concerned about dramatic changes to the lives that they they thought they understood. You know, the Industrial Revolution was fairly dramatic too, but we're fairly sure that we think it's a good thing in retrospect. Yeah. And it's the same deal, really. I think that, you know, if we think about it as the quest for immortality, then we're bound to get scared. But if we think about it as the quest for not getting Alzheimer's disease or cancer or whatever, then it doesn't sound so scary at all. When, when you break down the various reasons that we die, again, short of getting hit by a bus or some sort of traumatic accident like that, uh, there is this idea that somehow maybe we're just programmed to die. Um, eventually, even in the best situation, if you take a cell from the human body and give it the perfect...